here with the Clarinet Project, and I am going to ask some of your clarinet questions. So if you have any particular clarinet questions, go ahead and put them in the chat so that we can talk about them while I fix my hair a little bit. But before we get any questions in there, I want to jump right in and just talk about some of the ones that I see frequently. And one of the, ones, the things I want to talk about today is something that I've been seeing a lot of lessons recently is unfortunately a leaky B slash E key. And that is something that I usually recommend students going to the music shop to fix. It's not something I recommend for people doing on their own, but I want to bring it to your attention because a lot of us are playing the clarinet on our own right now. And we want to make sure that that key is working for us. If it's not working, a lot of times people think that they themselves are the problem, that they're not blowing enough air, or they have a read that isn't working, or that's personal fault, and it actually is the clarinet that is out of adjustment. Another thing I'll see when the B, E key is not in alignment is people will play a scale like this, like the D scale, right? They'll have D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, but since they can only get the B to work if they press the C key down at the same time, which is not ideal, you wanna be able to just play the B on its own, they'll slide to the C sharp, and that can lead to a lot of inaccuracies. So instead of doing B, C sharp, D, they'll do B, slide to the C sharp, D. So I wanted to talk to you about a way that you can check to see if your B, E key is out of alignment. So what you want to do is play B over the break. And you can tap here with the C key. So if you're used to playing B like this with the C key down, just go ahead and lift up your right hand pinky from the C key. Hi Shane! And if it still works, then you are good to go. We have one more step to double check. So, if that doesn't work, if you, as soon as you lift up your C key and the B key is leaky there, we have another way to double check just to make sure. So, I want you to play an F natural and then drop your fingers for the B. Once again, not using this pinky. Usually, if that B, E key is leaking, if it's not in alignment, that won't work. It'll sound like this. Like that. And that's usually how I have students check to see if their B, E key isn't lined up. Once again, as a teacher, it's really important to pay attention to this for your students because they will think that they are the problem, that they are the ones that are messing up or they're not good enough playing the clarinet over the break because a lot of schools and a lot of programs have you play that B first going over the break and it's actually quite a difficult note playing over the break. I'm gonna cough, it is not COVID, but even if it was, you guys are safe. <coughs> Excuse me. So another way you can check for it, and I usually use this, if that F to B isn't working, then I usually do the suction test. So what you're gonna do is take this nice squishy part of the palm of your hand, your right hand, and put the base of your clarinet there. Wait, nope, you're gonna use the squishy part of your left hand, otherwise you won't be able to press this low E key down right there. So you're gonna use that squishy part right there, and then you suck all the air out of the clarinet, and it should make that popping noise. If it doesn't make that popping noise, if it sounds like this, right, then you have a leak in there. You have to make sure that you're covering up the holes with the pads of your fingers, otherwise that suction test doesn't work. So those are some ways to pay attention to that. And once again, as a teacher, you have to pay a lot of attention. Hi, Danny, or Daisy, hi, Daisy. Um, you have to pay attention to what's going on with your student's clarinet. And it's a little tricky these days if we're teaching online. A lot of our programs are online right now. So just pay attention to your student's fingers, your own fingers, how you're fingering things. But you shouldn't have to press this C key down when you are playing the B. All right. So, hi, King CK. All right, tips on playing faster. Shane says, I got a lesson with Michelle Anderson. And I'm getting a lesson with Pablo. That's great news. Congratulations. Good for you. And as a reminder to anybody that's new here, I also teach lessons too. You can reach me at csweetie at gmail.com if you would like to know more about that or go to my website, theclarinetproject.com to find out about clarinet lessons with me. All right. Um, King CK, tips on playing faster. 
And this is a great question. This is one I get a lot. And it can be an interesting question depending on your philosophy. A lot of teachers will tell you that you need to play slower to play faster. And that is important as something that I personally do, but sometimes that can get boring and it can get frustrating. So if I have a particular 16th note passage, for instance, that I need to play faster and it's giving me trouble, sometimes I will literally make that my warm up routine. So let's say, you know, I'll just do an arpeggio right now, like that. I will make that my warm up. nice and slow. It's important to do long tones anyway, but if you can get it smooth and connected and beautiful as a long tone warm up, you will be able to play that faster. One of the, so playing everything slow with a metronome, speeding it up that way. I actually like to play games with the metronome because once again, I try not to get bored when I play. If I'm getting bored when I'm playing, my mind tends to wander and I don't get a lot of focus practicing done. So I will actually put my metronome on the 16th notes so that I'm hearing the click and the sound of the pitch at the same time and I can work on lining it up with the metronome that way. Then once it gets to a certain speed, I'll do the eighth notes. So I have two 16th notes per eighth note. And then I will do the quarter note. So I have the four 16th notes per quarter note. So I do like to play a little bit of these metronome games. I have a metronome app that will drop a beat in there randomly at a certain percentage. So I'll be hearing like that. So I'll lose a beat somewhere. So that keeps me paying attention. So I am one of the people that likes to play slow with a metronome and gradually click it up and get faster. I also do um, beat by beat practice and note by note practice. So if I'm doing that arpeggio again, I will do this kind of practice. Like that. And I'll add a note. I'll add a note below and then keep adding it back up that way. So I actually do a lot of different ways to work on speeding it up by my practice technique of the slow metronome practice, the slow long tone practice, adding notes, adding beats together that way. Now let's talk a little bit about mechanics of playing faster. In a lot of my videos, if you've watched them, I talk a lot about keeping your fingers curved and close. This is a great way to get you faster, okay? One of the big ones that I see with clarinet players is this. They'll play A and they're holding on to the clarinet like that. It is very hard to get back to that F if you need to or your register key. So once again, keeping your fingers curved and close includes this thumb in the back. It includes keeping your pinkies right here and ready to go. Watch out for rod holding and jamming those fingers in under there. That's a too. And then lastly, um, really watch how far you lift up your fingers when you play. So practicing in front of a mirror, practicing in front of your smartphone. There's even this device that puts this piece of plastic in front of your hands and you can lift up your fingers and you can feel them hitting the plastic and you will know that if you're hitting it too close. So keeping your fingers curved and close, having very rhythmic fingers and also practicing slowly and little pieces at a time are ways that you can get faster in your playing. All right, I'm having a lot of questions roll in now. So I'm gonna try and get to as many as I can, um, but I won't be able to get to everybody. So if I didn't get to your question, please send it to me. Uh, um, you can um, put it in the community part. You can put it in the comments comment section later on or you can comment on one of my other videos or send me an email. All right. Okay. Alina says, whenever I play my high notes, they all squeak and I'm not hitting any side keys or anything. I asked my band teacher, but he says I'm hitting the side keys. Do you have any idea what's going on? Oh, this is a good one. And it is such a bummer that when you say, hey, I am squeaking. And then somebody goes, you're hitting the side keys. And you're like, no, I swear I'm not hitting the side keys. And they're all like, yes, you are. And you're like, no, I'm not. It's kind of like gaslighting, but in clarinet land. So it's a bit of a bummer. Okay. Also, just in defense of your band director, it's really hard to monitor everybody. Okay. So some of the things that I noticed was squeaking in the high range. Yes, you can bump the side keys. That is one of them. Um, another one is not, cur not covering the holes. Okay. But the biggest one that I notice is biting. So a lot of us will, will pinch and we're pinching that reed against the mouthpiece to get those high notes to speak better. 
when you're practicing the high notes, I suggest going slowly. And if they're still squeaking, try the double lip embouchure. So this is how we normally have our embouchure with our bottom lip covering our bottom teeth. Try covering your top teeth with your top lip. This is something that there are some professional clarinet players do. It gives you a wonderful dark sound and you will build a very strong embouchure that way but you cannot bite. So practice getting up into your higher range that way, nice and slowly, one note at a time. I have a nice warm up on Muse score, the reach to C warm up, where it goes like this. Try that warm up with that double lip embouchure and see if that helps you not bite. And if you're not biting, then hopefully you're not squeaking, you're pinching, not, not pinching those notes to get them out. So try that and see how that works for you. Okay. Um, all right. Next question is from Eric. Do you have any preferences on the E flat lever because you have an upper level buffet that normally comes with it unless you removed it? Yes, I have a buffet prestige. It did come with an E flat flat lever here. So I have this E flat key here and then it came with an E flat key there. I removed mine because my E flat lever on my prestige was too hard to reach. So I was stretching here and it hurt my hand. So if you see how far that stretches, that's a lot for my pinky. I don't have much of a stretch. My hands aren't that small, but stretching is hard for me. And I could feel the pull in here and it actually hurt my hand. So since I wasn't using it, I took it off. It, the, the weight that it put on the clarinet for that key is minimal, but I figured I would try and make my clarinet a little bit lighter so I had a little bit less weight on my right hand. So um, the left hand E flat lever is all personal. If you can reach it and you use it a lot, that's great. I also learned how to slide and I don't have that many situations where I need to have that E flat lever. Every now and then, let's say I'm playing Daphnis and Chloe or something's in the key of B like the France Concerto, I, I will actually consider putting it back on I did try I did try those Ubel clarinets in November and they had a lever I could reach. So you can um, have a clarinet, um, you can try different clarinets where you can reach them better or you can actually modify that E flat lever so you can get to it better if it is something that is hard for you to get to. Um, okay, next one is from Mackenzie. Hi, I'm new, but I've been watching for my chromatic scale uh, for honor land. Oh yes, good luck for your audition for honor band for chromatic scale. Um, the biggest advice I have as as a judge for district band, I judge district band auditions and a lot of times I end up in the chromatic scale room. Um, the biggest thing that you need to show those judges is not just that you know the notes and you can play all the notes and they sound beautiful and smooth and even, is that you have a good solid rhythmic pulse. So every 16th note, if you play the chromatic scale like we do in Virginia, right, like that, it's just the 16th notes. They have to be very rhythmic and very, uh, not rigid sounding, but very strong and a good skeleton. Because when I am a judge and I'm listening behind the screen and I can't see anybody, I am building a band. And the most important thing in a band for me is good, strong rhythm. So even if you have the most accurate notes and you have the best, most beautiful sound and the greatest intonation, if you don't have good rhythm, them, you're doing all of those things in the wrong place so we can't have you there so if anything go for that real solid rhythmic chromatic scale <laughs> You want to have every 16th note mathematically perfect. I'm going to go way back to the beginning of this live stream when I was saying that I will put the metronome on 16th notes and I will play a group of 16th notes and line up each one with the metronome. That's for stuff like this. So good luck with your audition. Okay, next one. Um, Shane, how do you circular breathe and double tongue? Shane, I think I already got to you with one question, so I'm going to try and get to somebody else. Um, but if we have time at the end, I'll come back around to that. Um, okay. Um, do, 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 do. Wow, a lot of you guys wrote in. This is a lot. Um, I like he says, um, <laughs> my name goes, I don't think clarinets double tongue. They do. We can double tongue. And there's some people that do it really well. Ricardo Morales is one of those people that double tongues really well. Um, there's a great clarinetist in New York, David Sapodin. He was one of my... Um, 
mentors and friends when I was at Bowdoin Music Festival. Great double tonguer there. Um, and so, yes, you can do it. I do it on the bass clarinet because it's easier for me on the bass than it is in the B flat. But it's basically the t -k -t -k -t -k kind of routine. So the t in the front and the k in the back. And then you work on speeding it up. And that's real muscle building right there. And then, of course, you have to line it up with your fingers. So it takes time to get there. But once you start getting into it, you actually can do it really well. It's kind of like riding a bike. A little bit scary and wobbly at first. But once you get going, you can do it. Um, okay. And then, um, it, yeah, a bunch of people are jumping in that, yes, you can double tum on the clarinet. Um, okay. Um, it's kind of some of the professional music, though. Yeah, you know, I know people that aren't professionals that double tongue. I've had students that have double tongued. It's just putting the time in. Think about all the great guitarists out there. They're all self basically, right? And so they just sat in their rooms and they were picking and they were just doing everything and strumming and I'm really showing how I don't play the guitar here. But I think what's really interesting about it is you go and you Google the 100 best guitarists ever. Um, what's really neat about it is that when people write about the guitarists, they're like, and this was his style and these are the cool things he did with the guitar. And as clarinet players, we get sort of trapped in this classical music um, official wind ensemble world of everybody has to do it the same way. And there's always the right way to do it. And if you don't do it the you know this way, you're doing it wrong. And I, you know, I have to say that I make my students do the correct fingerings for chromatic scale and things like that to help them play it faster. But I'm always amazed and um, proud and fascinated by the people that do all these extended techniques on the clarinet, like double tonguing and really extreme altissimo and quarter tones. And people be like, wow, listen to your sound, or so-and-so does this really cool thing with the clarinet. And that expands our world as clarinet players, too. Listen to other kinds of clarinet playing. There is a whole world of Arabic and Middle Eastern clarinet playing that is crazy good, amazing. And they play these little G clarinets and everything. It's really cool. And I never knew about that. I only learned about that very traditional classical training and some jazz, right? And then there's these people all around the world that are playing the clarinet in all these different ways. Okay. All right. Here we go. Um, how much is a professional clarinet? That's from Daisy. Um, so professional clarinets, it depends on the company that you go with. So if you, um, for instance, this buffet prestige at the time I bought it, it was about $6,000. Um, and then, um, when I reviewed some of the Ubel clarinets, they were anywhere from $2,600 to $7,000. Bakun clarinets can be anywhere from, you know, $6,000 to $11,000. $7,000. So they're in the multi-thousand dollar range usually. And I recommend to my students a lot of times if they're moving into the world of buying a wooden clarinet to actually skip over the student models and actually buy a used professional model. And actually there are a lot of companies now, a lot of up and coming companies that have lower level professional models that are the same price as student model wooden clarinets. So definitely shop around and try some different clarinets. We're seeing a lot of innovation coming from clarinet companies right now. Okay. Um, all right. And then Alina said, when I say high notes, I mean like high G, are you talking G, G, uh, Alina, if you could just qualify that with it, whether or not it's the altissimo G, F, E, D, C, B, or this G, F, E, D, C, which is the clarion G. Um, it's one of the tricks, um, unfortunately, with playing, you know, clarinet and talking about music in general is that it's hard to figure out what the range is just by the notes. We need to know where in the clarinet. Um, it looks like, um, okay, and um, so Dave said going over the break maybe... Uh, yeah, Mackenzie said they are pretty expensive. And Shane jumped in with um, the euros from 1,500 euros to 13,000 euros. And um, that's, yeah, they can get really expensive. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Mackenzie says, I'm new and I've been watching you, Chromatic Scale. All right, we did that one. And you are welcome, Alina. And how does one do a Chromatic Scale, particularly when using the register key? Unfortunately, I never learned music theory and I'm having a hard time finding the octaves by ear. Ha ha! And there's a reason, Dave, that you cannot find the octaves by ear on the clarinet with the register key because it is not an octave key. So the clarinet is what is known as a stopped pipe. We're not conical like an oboe, and we are not open like a flute where they blow across the top. 
therefore we don't have an octave key. It's a 12th. So when you hit this key here, you don't go from C to C, you go from C to G. So if you're playing the um, saxophone, it would be an octave. If you're playing oboe, it would be an octave. Flute, it would be an octave, but not us. So it makes playing Susan Marches really, really fun um, because we don't have a little octave key. Okay, so that's one of your troubles, Dave, is that we don't have um, we don't have octaves. We're not built on octaves. We're built on twelfths, which is why the clarinet has such a beautiful, unusual sound. So it has this wonderful dark sound. Uh, the opening of Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony is two clarinets playing in unison. It's got this sort of cold far away, mysterious kind of sound. I love it so much. So that is um, one of the things there. So chromatic scale is basically every note is a half step apart. And it's a great way to get to know your clarinet and how to play your clarinet. We're gonna, we start down here at the bottom and then you do E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp. It would take me very long time to go over the chromatic scale note by note in a video right here for everybody, um, especially because I have to wrap up soon. But I do have tutorial videos about chromatic scales on the Clarinet Project where I do go note by note and I break it up into little groups of five. So five, not five, so it's easier to practice. But yes, there I do have resources on this YouTube channel for learning the chromatic scale note by note. Okay, all right, let's do one more question and then I will wrap up for the day. All right, Clayton, being a newly appointed section leader this year, how do you suggest taking sectionals online? feels bad for canceled performance. Oh, I f once again, I've, as I've been saying in the live streams all year, I'm so, I feel so sad for all the canceled performances, all the canceled band programs, and it's a bummer. Okay, so working online, there, um, there's some things that we can do. So what I suggest, Clayton, is to Google, um, and for all of you that are running sectionals online, if you're doing group lessons online, if you're doing your band rehearsals online, um, these are some things I learned from my daughter's Suzuki violin and Suzuki piano lessons. Mainly the Suzuki violin, because that was usually, we always had a weekly group class component. And one of the things when you're working with two, three, and four year olds with violin is they can't focus on the violin that long. So their, her teacher had all these wonderful Suzuki violin games to help sort of focus them. And they were musical, but not in a way that we would think of. So look up Suzuki games. There's some really cute, um, like number memorization games where you say a number and then you add a different number to it each time and they have to call back to you. Um, so try some some different things outside of um, clarinet, outside of music to sort of do that team building, but it also comes back to music skills that we need, like memorization. So look up Suzuki games. Um, I would also Google um, online um, music lesson games. I did um, the Clarinet Academy this year completely online and we were able to have rehearsals and we did put together the multi-track video. Um, we didn't have people that could do acapella. We did actually use a sound engineer for that. But if you have everybody Clayton in your section that can get onto or get a hold of acapella, you can do a multi-track video together, which might be kind of fun to do. Um, you can play together, but not in the way that obviously we normally can and, and what's most fulfilling to us. So what I do is I have everybody mute themselves and then I'll play along. So if you're doing sectionals and you're working on a third clarinet part, um, uh, you know, and if you can have an assistant section leader, that'd be great because you can do this in breakout rooms. So I would play that third clarinet part nice and slowly for people to play along with me. Um, for those of you that are uncomfortable playing by yourself, this is now your time to shine to start learning um, how to play by yourself in front of other people. And then I'd have people play it for me individually so that I could give them a mini lesson or tips on it. One of the things that I found that works really well is the questioning technique when teaching. So instead of saying, oh my God, that sounds like poop, you can say something like, so tell me a little bit about what's going on here. 
Uh, and that way you're not hurting anybody's feelings, but you're also trying to, you know, pull out information. There's a really great book out there called The Critical Response Method by Liz Lerman. Um, she was a dancer and she was frustrated because when she would ask her friends, hey, how did you like my performance? They'd be like, it was great. And they wouldn't give her any feedback. And yet when she'd get a review in the paper, sometimes she'd have a scathing review where they tear it to pieces. So taking that extreme on both sides, she came up with the critical response method, which is the questioning version. So you know, tell me a little bit um, about what you're doing with the dynamics here, or what is your key signature again? So sometimes when I'm working with sectionals and somebody's really struggling, I don't want to call them out. So I will do things like, and forgive me for those of you that work with me in person, I'll say things like, hey, can we play that section again? I just need to hear the intonation, but let's do it slower so I can hear the intonation better. But it's really that person is missing the notes a lot and I don't want to call them out on it so let's just have them do it a little bit slower but honestly if they're really having problems with it that's when you can say hey do you want to meet me offline a little bit just us so we can work on that or you can use that as a teaching method method for everybody being like oh yeah what Bob is doing over there is really difficult and he's having trouble getting over the break to that B here are some exercises that work for that that worked for me um, so yeah really just to sum that up all real quickly um, use that mute button they can mute themselves and you can play or vice versa so that you can get some playing together um, try some different games music games and things like that um, one of the things that I love and I have this on the YouTube channel here I have a playlist of John Williams um, movies that he wrote the music for so it's kind of fun to do that in sectionals and be like all right everybody you know like um, I don't let them see my screen so I don't share the screen I'll be like all right what movie is this what movie is this what movie is that you you can also do that with clarinet pieces. What clarinet piece is this? Which clarinetist is this? So you can incorporate a lot of other things in um, teaching online for group classes like uh, music listening and music history and music appreciation. We have to be very creative right now in ways to connect and reach out to each other and that is one of the ones that worked for me. Um, so that is my very long answer to that great question and thank you so much. Um, so Clayton and everybody else that's a section leader or a teacher right now, um, good luck with everything. Um, we can do it. We'll get through this. Eventually we'll all play together. I feel like we have to have a great big clarinet party when we're all done here. Um, all right, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry if I didn't make it to your question in time. Um, please uh, meet me here. I'll try and do this next for the next couple of weeks, um, the Ask a Clarinet Teacher. So if you get here early, then you can ask your question early. All right. Bye, everybody, and happy clarinetting.